Well, here it is, the review you've been waiting for, yearning for, lusting for even. But before I begin, there are a few things I would like to talk about. First and foremost, this is not the worst book I've ever read. But also, this is not a good book. And finally, ladies, yes, you ladies out there, you deserve better. You deserve so much better. But what is the hook? What is the fourth wing about? Violet Soringale wanted nothing more than to be a scribe. But her mother, who is also the commanding general, forced her into the Dragon Rider Academy. And while she flounders to survive, she catches sight of someone who she can't resist, who also wants her dead. Will dragon fire or lust be her end? So what did I think? Well, I should probably preface this with the fact that I know this book was not written for me. I am not the demographic. You guys, yes, you guys out there requested this review, however, so I am going to do my best and be as fair as possible, strip myself away entirely from the things that I knew I wouldn't like and judge this story purely on the merits of storytelling. So let's talk about setting and I'm just gonna talk about it briefly. So this was clearly written by someone who has never written a fantasy novel. There isn't a lot of depth of the world building, which is fine because character for me is, is what I look for most. Uh, but when you discuss shoe sizes and say phrases like for the win and badass, I have a problem. Yes, I have a problem. It's far too anachronistic for me. And while fantasy isn't technically a historical setting, you can't argue that it's borrowing heavily from it, particularly medieval Europe. And so, yes, you can step outside of that because we're talking about dragons and magic, but I feel like she just went a little bit too far. And that is how you break immersion. That is how you destroy my suspension of disbelief. All right, well, let us move on with character. And there are only two characters to speak of because the rest of the supporting cast are empty vessels. Talking heads without faces. So let's begin with our protagonist, Violet Sorengale. She wants to be a scribe lost among the stacks of books in the vast libraries, but her mother, her mother says no. Uh, she says she must be a dragon rider one of these elite soldiers of the nation. Now on the surface, I like this. It's called irony, which is a very powerful tool in storytelling. Uh, that's because this is essentially the worst person for the job, which is a great trope because it has inherent conflict, conflict, the heart of story. What will Violet do? Surely she can't make it into the academy and become a dragon rider. Well, this is where the irony ends. Sure, she isn't the most physically adept. Sure, she stumbles, gets a bruise or two, but that's about it. There are no true low points for her in this story. There are no scenes of internal struggle, her trying to shun her duty because she wants to be a scribe to sneak back into the library, right? Which means no conflict. Yaros could have had a great setup. A girl who tries desperately to run from what she has been ordered to do. A girl forced to use her own brains instead of her brawn to overcome highly physical demands of being a dragon rider. But no, none of that happens. Again, no internal conflict present on the page, which would have allowed us to empathize with this character and follow her, no matter where she went. This is poor characterization, which is the root of why this story is so utterly boring. And I think we should briefly talk about love triangles, because it does relate to character. So there is a man, his name is Dane. He knew her from childhood. Now he's a stud, because of course he is. And in addition to him, we have Zayden, our antagonist slash love interest. Oh no, a love triangle. Sounds very familiar, doesn't it? And as you know, the reason why love triangles create conflict is because there are no even sides. Who does she choose? Why? Well, the great thing about Violet's situation is she doesn't have to. She is given an out very early on in the story. So one of the most basic tropes of romance is a complete and utter failure. Again, no conflict. And Violet, of course, she turns out to be special. Unlike any other dragon rider before her, yada, 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 I'm sure you get the picture where we're going here, the chosen one. And unfortunately, all the way through the 600 pages of this novel, there is no redemption for this character. Let's briefly talk about Zayden, our antagonist, the love interest, the man who stands, and I quote from Violet's perspective, at least four inches over six feet tall. Who the hell talks like that? I can't think of a more awkward way to say someone is six foot four. Anyway, He's part of a conquered nation of people who are forced into this dragon riding academy to either quote unquote, die or prove their loyalty to the nation. So he's a child of murdered parents. He's a child of a murdered nation. And they don't think anything will come of that. Hmm, interesting. No uprising, no betrayal. 
kind of weak world building, and I probably should have talked about that in the world building section. Zayden, he's our typical hard ass. He's a badass dragon rider. He even gives Violet her nickname. Wait for it. Violence. Yes, that is her nickname. Violence. Jesus Christ. But this tall, dark, and handsome man, he has a soft side, of course, because, you know, we all do. And when Violet can't tame her loins, there's a great scene in the book where she has him kind of pushed up against the wall. And, uh, you know, they're getting very hungry. They're getting very hungry. And he stops her. He stops her and says, no, 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 we can't do this right here. Keep in mind, this is the man who wanted to kill her at the beginning of the book. He's all over her. But the, the good guy he is, he's covered in scars. But still, he says, this is the dragon's lust. This isn't you. This isn't you wanting me. And so he pushes her away and he, he goes back to his room. I think this is the first book I've ever read where a guy gave a girl blue balls. And another thing interesting about this character is we get an entire chapter later in the book from Zayden's POV. I forgot to mention that too. I'll probably talk more about it in the writing section, but this entire book is written in first person present tense, which has its own shortcomings, which I'll talk about as well in the writing section. Uh, but the funny thing here is he sounds just like Violet. So I know a lot of times women criticize male writers for not understanding how to write females. Well, Yaros, right back at you. Not to say you've ever criticized a male writer, but uh, you cannot write men because it is clear in the POV chapter. So you could argue in a lot of ways throughout the course of the book, well, some guy would have an action like this. Some guy would do things like this. Some guys would say things like that. But when you get deeply in the head of this man, toward the end of the book, it's probably some of the most unrealistic male internal goings on that I've ever read, ever seen in a film, even, even the cheesiest movies. But here's the thing. Remember when I said that he wanted to kill her early on, right? He has this historical reason to do so, right? His parents were murdered. His people was murdered. So you may be asking, you may be even thinking right now, wow, what a great opportunity to have this hatred rear its head at the very end of the book to have it completely destroy the love or lust or whatever you want to call it between these two people. Nope, never happens, never happens, never happens. And that, again, is an absolute failure. And I think that's one thing I was hoping for is that, that Yaros would um, use these things. She'd remember these things. She'd remember the seeds she planted, the characters she was crafting, and bring it back. Bring it back to show us that she's an accomplished writer, that she understands characterization. But alas, no. So I think we should probably talk about the plot next. It's very familiar. We have this girl, she's pushed into a profession she doesn't want, though she doesn't fight back. And I think that's the biggest shortcoming too for me is that if she wanted to be a scribe so bad, I feel like she would have done something, anything, run away from home. I mean, even that's a, a typical trope. She didn't do any of that. She just goes right in it. This has to go through these extremely deadly trials and we don't get this interesting internal conflict. We don't have a girl with her head in the clouds thinking of books. You know, again, a, a very bookish kind of person I don't feel like would act like her. But she struggles through this training. But yes, she does something that absolutely no one has ever done in the history of dragon riding. And this is a bit of a spoiler, but I'm sure those of you out there watching this review, you've either read the book or just here to laugh at me because I had to read the book. She, uh, she, she bonds to two dragons, not one dragon, but two. And the way it works in this book is that... Um, you know, once you go through this, these crazy trials and you finally meet a dragon because uh, the humans don't control the dragons in this book. It's more like a symbiotic relationship, right? The dragon chooses you. So it's like a it's like a one to one thing. It's not like a pet sort of situation, but it gets better. It gets better because she bo bonds to two dragons, like I said. And guess what? And one of these dragons, one of these dragons is Zayden's dragon, which means she's bound to Zayden. What? Oh my God, what a revelation. So not only has she done the impossible, she's done the unthinkable. She's been bound to two dragons, not one dragon, but two dragons. One of these dragons is bound to Zayden. And generally at this point in the book, she has the hots for him, right? She has definitely the hots for him. There's still that like forced conflict going on. Anyway, it doesn't work. I've already talked about it. And all of that just kind of goes away. And most of the book is like this. She's training. It's about her lust. And then about 75% in the book, because I know you're here for this. I know this is what you want to know. This is when she gets the goods. This is when she gets to finally give in to her lust. And, and Zayden finally as well. He's not, um, <laughs> he's not upset that it's dragon lust anymore. He knows it's her lust. And so they give in. And this is probably one of the most hilarious sex scenes I've ever read, uh, ever experienced. Well, <laughs> 
Uh, I won't talk about my sex life. I just mean in movies and fiction. This is a good thing. This is a good thing because part of the, the reason about this or part of what I was hoping this book was going to give me is it was going to give me hilarity. It was going to be just so over the top, so ridiculous, so cringy that that would get me through it. I would just laugh my way through this book. But it didn't because the second act or so ish, right? The second act, I could tell Rebecca Yaros was really trying to tell kind of a serious story in a way, in a way. Let's just say she was trying. It felt like she was trying. And so she toned back all of the ridiculous things. She toned back so much of the stuff that was helping me get through this book that it became really boring. And this is not a short book, right? It's, it's about 600 or so pages. And so unfortunately, at that point, I was left with mediocrity. There was even a time where... Um, you know, because when I read books I, and, and I'm not into it and you're kind of in that analytical view because you're not engrossed in the fiction, which is exactly what you don't want to happen. I try to figure out because I knew I had to read this. I promised you guys I would read it. I try to figure out like, OK, what can get me through this or or what, you know, I'll think of it like an education. Like, like what can I learn from this? What can I learn that other people might like? And so while I was reading it, the, the really cringy mel melodramatic dialogue reminded me of anime now, now again don't get me wrong i love anime I, I really enjoy it from time to time okay but you can't tell me it's not cheesy as hell it's not melodramatic as hell and that's exactly what this felt like in the beginning and so part of the time i was trying to put myself in that headspace picture this whole thing like anime and that was going to get me through it unfortunately that didn't either it kind of kind of petered out again because i think yaros was really trying to get serious at some point and unfortunately in doing that she stripped away any kind of joy i was going to have reading this book at least in the second act because there's some more hilarious stuff that happens later on and it's also worth mentioning that yes the story is it feels like in a way written by committee written very very strictly by a beat sheet because you can see i, I read in kindle and you can see the 25 percent mark the 50 percent mark the 75 percent mark by the way is when the sex happens uh, you can see some shifts in the story structure and it's not really a bad thing except it's when you see it so that means you're not into the story that means you're not swept away into this fantasy world while i'd argue that you know not every story has to fit these conventional beats like i think it's a good thing they're there because they work for a reason but me noticing it is a mark of a bad story because again like i said i am taken out of this setting i'm taken out of the magic i'm no longer in another world i'm reading words on a page so let's talk about the writing itself or as i like to call it the cinematography of the novel uh first and foremost this is told in uh first person present tense and uh let, let's start right there because there's problems with this voice and i always like to think like okay why is someone choosing a particular voice for a book uh why is it third person past tense why is it third person, present tense. Why is it first person, et cetera, et cetera. You get the idea. Uh, generally, first person novels in past tense, uh, it implies uh, someone documenting an experience, right? Either writing it down, maybe it's an audio recording, something else. Uh, granted, you don't have to do that, but I feel like it makes it more authentic in that regard, you know? So presumably the narrator has survived this ordeal. So, you know, first person, present tense is a weird one. It's a modern thing. Uh, it's, it's more ubiquitous and in, in young adult and stuff because it gives a sense of immediate immediacy. I think that's what the whole thing about present tense is. And I think it works to a degree. The problem is Rebecca Yarrow, she doesn't understand the shortcomings of it, of it. And there are shortcomings. So for example, when you are in third person past tense, uh, you can speed through things, right? Because it's already happened. You don't have to cover every single beat. When you're in first person present tense, you're not a time traveler. You can't zoom through the future. And that's what she does numerous times in this book, unfortunately. So uh, there's there's points where uh, she kind of summarizes some things, which you often see in third person past tense, the keywords being past tense. Uh, but she, like I said, summarizes over some events because she wants to get through them because that's often what you do in writing. You, you, you do a little bit of telling. You don't have to show the entire time because you want to show the impactful moments, not um, show every little beat by beat thing. The problem is, with first person present tense, you're stuck in the present. Now, granted, you could probably chapter by chapter or maybe scene by scene sort of skip, like you're not saying some things, I guess, but you can't, within the prose itself, skip ahead. And she does that all the time. All right, now I think, <laughs> I think we should really talk about, and let me find some notes here because I have some notes. Uh, one thing that I'm, I'm very guilty of, or at least I, I really try to watch when I write myself, and that is overused words. So for whatever reason, Rebecca Yaros likes to have characters raise their eyebrows, arch their eyebrows. Uh, their eyebrows even shoot up from time to time. In fact, uh, I looked up, <laughs> I looked up the word brow on my Kindle 
and it shows up 206 times. Now, you may be saying, well, brow could be in brown. I got you. So I corrected for brown and found uh, that brought it down to about 156, I think, 150, over 150 times. The word brow, eyebrow, etc., etc. Now that this book is about, I think, 600-ish pages, like I said, that means that at least once every four pages, there is someone raising their eyebrows or furrowing their eyebrows. There's eyebrow action happening. That How did an editor miss that? Because these eyebrows were literally punching me in the eye as I read this book. Um, some other things, uh, she likes to use retort a lot instead of said. I, I noticed that a lot in, in sort of like more... I don't want to say young adult because I don't really read young adult, but <laughs> fiction masquerading as young adult in a way. I don't know. But this is where um, it gets more fun. And this is sort of where um, I'll, I'll talk more about. I know this is kind of a weird tangent, but I'll talk more about Daniel Green in my review of his books uh, later. But uh, so the word shit, the word shit shows up 172 times. But get this. This is the mother. The word fuck. 253 times. Now, let me remind you again, this book is between 500 and 600 pages. I think my Kindle has said 600, but I think, you know, the hardback says around 500. So let that sink in. Let that sink in. It's kind of a uh, the mark of an of, of an amateur writer. And, and she is not, not an amateur, not by any stretch. She's written, I think, like 20 books or so. But anyway, another thing she likes to do is punctuates many Lines with periods. So I know every line have a, has a period. I'm not an idiot. But what I'm talking about is when you take a sentence like uh, get over here, get period, over period, here. So she likes to do that, which is fine. I've done it before. I've seen it. In, I see it in writing all the time. But again, it's overuse. It's all the time. And I think I think I watched another review where somebody was commenting on that. The theme is overuse here. She uses it too, too often. She uses all of these things too often. She repeats words, repeats phrases, does all kinds of things that really detract from, again, immersion. But let me, let me say something nice about the writing, right? Because I've been harping on this book for so long. Uh, I would say the writing outside of all of that stuff, the prose itself anyway, it's not terrible. Um, it's, it, it, it doesn't really get in the way. Granted, there's a lot of, um, over, over description. There's description stuffing, as I like to call it, where, you know, so-and-so said her brown hair curling around her ear while she licks her lips. I know that's probably a terrible example, but it kind of like trips you up when you're reading. And, and that's often here. I don't know if that's, uh, you know, sort of a thing that's part of the romance genre and that's just what people come to expect. But to me, it felt like someone just being overly descriptive about, physical characteristics when you don't really need to. Um, that's something I've, I've always noticed and tried to um, watch with my own stuff and is that you don't really need to describe every little thing. And another thing she did often was describe exactly where people were. Like, you know, he stood three steps ahead of me, so he was at eye level. And granted, that's not a terrible thing to do, but it's when you do it all of the time, it kind of trips you up, which is really a mark of someone being self-conscious, right? When they're so obsessed with showing you every detail of the staging of a scene, which is why I'm going to give... Fourth Wing by Rebecca Yaros, a three out of 10. A fantasy book written by someone who has never read a fantasy novel. A romance book written by someone who doesn't understand the mechanics of basic love triangles with characters that are as flat as they come and a plot that drags because of all of the above and writing that feels like fan fiction of a teenage girl. I know that sounds terrible, but I tried. I truly tried to at least pull myself away from it. Um, see what the target audience might see in this, but I just couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I couldn't find much. And so this remains a phenomenon. I just, I just don't understand. But before I go, the Daniel Green thing, um, I should, I, I should apologize to Daniel Green. So Daniel, if you're ever watching this, I criticized you on, I think all three of your books that I've reviewed that I felt like you didn't know what you were doing in, in tonality wise, right? You'd have kind of some, try to make some deep character moments, but then also it felt like young adult often, but then there'd be like a lot of swearing, like we find in the fourth wing. Uh, there'd be a lot of, not a lot of sex, but there'd be some sexual things. So it was kind of this, this weird blend of, of YA and adult. Well, uh, I, I apologize because I, I didn't know what the genre of new adult was. And that seems to be what we have here. So if that's what you're going for with your books, I apologize. Um, I will I will retract that from my review officially. But if you weren't trying to write young adult, I'm sorry, but you have written young adult. Anyway, that's where I'm going to leave it. That's the review. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know. Have you read Fourth Wing? Did you <laughs> did you did you love it as much as I did? 
or did you dislike it even more? I tried to make this review as, I don't want to say objective, but you know, taking myself out of the equation as much as I could. So hopefully you enjoyed it. I know it was a little bit long, but I really wanted to hopefully articulate my problems with the book and, and why even outside of me not being the target demographic, it just doesn't work as a novel. And if you'd like to check out my own work, my own novels to see if I, in fact, uh, write new adults, uh, you can check out the Amazon link down in the description below. And thanks for watching. Thanks for hanging out with me. And I will see you in the next one.